We're now going to examine the regulation of our uh, breathing, and this involves what is known as the respiratory reflex center located in the medulla oblongata of the brain. So we've written here on page 321, respiratory reflex center is located in the medulla oblongata of the brain. Now before I read what's written here, let's take a look at a diagram on the next page. This is page 322 in the lecture outline, and here is one of our typical box diagrams describing a reflex center. In this case, it's the respiratory reflex center located in the medulla oblongata. Now, we know that all control centers or reflex centers are designed to regulate or maintain a particular condition or parameter of the body constant. What is astonishing is the principal function of the respiratory reflex center is to regulate or maintain the pH of the cerebrospinal fluid around the brain at a pH of 7.4. That is astonishing because I'm sure that all of us would have presumed that the most important function of the respiratory reflex center is to regulate our oxygen levels. But in fact, the single most important factor uh, that determines uh, what the respiratory reflex center does is the acidity or pH of our body fluids. Since the main function of the respiratory reflex center is to regulate or maintain the pH of the cerebrospinal fluid, the most important sensory information that the respiratory reflex center requires comes from what are known as the central chemoreceptors. These central chemoreceptors uh, are sensitive to the hydrogen ion level in the cerebrospinal fluid. They're called central because they are located in the central nervous system around the brain, and they are monitoring the acidity of the cerebrospinal fluid. They are constantly sending that information to the respiratory reflex center, and as we know, what all reflex centers or control centers do is they compare what is the current situation in this case, what is the current acidity or pH of the cerebrospinal fluid? And the control center compares that with what is the set point, what is the desired condition. In this case, what is the desired pH of the cerebrospinal fluid? As we know, if they match, if the input signal coming in matches the set point, in other words, if the actual acidity of the cerebrospinal fluid matches the desired acidity, as indicated by the set point, then the re reflex center doesn't have to do anything. But we know that if the uh, actual condition of the body, in this case the acidity, is either lower or higher than the desired acidity, then the function of the reflex center is to send an output signal activating uh, the appropriate effector organs to correct or compensate and return the condition of the body to the desired state. Now the uh, effectors that the respiratory reflex center has control over are listed right here. So the respiratory reflex center can affect the phrenic nerves to the diaphragm muscle and the intercostal nerves to the intercostal muscles. Inside the phrenic and intercostal nerves are somatic motor neurons that can be used to speed up both the frequency of breathing, that's the respiratory rate, and also increase the tidal volume, that's the, the depth of breathing. In addition, the respiratory reflex center can activate either the parasympathetic or sympathetic autonomic motor neurons that innervate the bronchioles. The bronchioles are the small airways. We know that the sympathetic autonomic motor neurons cause bronchodilation, whereas the parasympathetic autonomic motor neurons cause bronchoconstriction. So, by activating these somatic motor neurons to the diaphragm and intercostal muscles, and by activating the autonomic motor neurons to the bronchioles, the respiratory reflex center should be able to correct or compensate for the acidity of the cerebrospinal fluid. The question is, how? So to answer that question, 
Let's return back to the previous page. Back on page 321, so we've just uh, summarized the motor outputs from the respiratory reflex center, include somatic motor neurons, to the respiratory muscles, that is the diaphragm and intercostal muscles for breathing, and the respiratory reflex center can activate autonomic motor neurons to the bronchioles and affect the degree of bronchoconstriction or bronchodilation. The most important sensory input, we've said, are this, comes from the central chemoreceptors. These are located on the bottom side of the brain, uh, the ventral surface of the medulla oblongata. They are sensitive to the hydrogen ion concentration in the cerebrospinal fluid. We are now going to describe what is known as the central chemoreceptor reflex. Whenever there is an increase in hydrogen ion level, in acidity, of the body fluids, especially the cerebrospinal fluid, the so-called central chemoreceptors are monitoring the cerebrospinal fluid. They inform the respiratory reflex center in the medulla oblongata. In response, the respiratory reflex center activates the somatic motor neurons uh, contained in the phrenic and intercostal nerves to the diaphragm and intercostal muscles increasing the frequency of breathing, the respiratory rate, and the tidal volume, the depth of breathing, and the respiratory reflex center activates the sympathetic autonomic motor neurons to cause bronchodilation. The question is, how does speeding up the uh, frequency of breathing and increasing tidal volume and dilating the airways, how does that lower the acidity? And this is the answer. This, it causes an overall increase in ventilation, the increased minute ventilation. And as somebody's breathing becomes faster and deeper and the airways dilate, this acts to increase the exhalation, the elimination of carbon dioxide out of our lungs, lowering the amount of carbon dioxide in our bloodstream. So this increased breathing blows off increased amounts of carbon dioxide. And we know that for every carbon dioxide that's in our blood, that is equivalent to a carbonic acid in our blood. Because we know that the carbon dioxide is in equilibrium uh, with carbonic acid. So for every carbon dioxide that you eliminate from your body, from your bloodstream, and exhale it out into the air, that is one less carbonic acid that is in your body. Remember, most of the carbon dioxide in our body is in the form of carbonic acid, which is in equilibrium with free hydrogen ion and bicarbonate. So you should view carbon dioxide as the major source of acidity in your body because for every carbon dioxide that's in your body, that's equivalent to an extra carbonic acid in your body. So blowing off, <laughs> exhaling carbon dioxide out of your body is reducing the amount of carbonic acid. Okay, you'd say, well, so what does that do? That is reducing the total amount of acid in your body. The problem was you were too acidic this reduces the acidity, it lowers the acidity. That's how this uh, central chemoreceptor reflex corrects or compensates uh, for increased acidity. Now, I did not write down what the reflex response would be if any time the acidity becomes less than it should be. But because of the beautiful symmetry uh, of the physiology of the body, we know that it's going to be the exact opposite. In other words, anytime there is a decrease in acidity in our body fluids, being, in other words, slightly alkalotic, the central chemoreceptors will inform the respiratory reflex center. The respiratory reflex center will cause a decrease in ventilation. It will cause a slowing down in the rate of breathing, a decreased tidal volume, bronchoconstriction, and all of this will result in an accumulation of carbon dioxide in your bloodstream. Rather than eliminating carbon dioxide, you will retain more carbon dioxide in your bloodstream by exhaling less. And as the carbon dioxide accumulates in your bloodstream, 
It, remember, it is combining with water, forming carbonic acid, which will increase the amount of acidity, correcting or compensating for having too little acid in your body. The potential danger of this is when one does voluntary hyperventilation. If one were to voluntarily hyperventilate, now you might say, well, like, when would you do that? So let's consider the following. What if we were going to have a breath-holding contest, and the prize for the person who can hold their breath the longest is they win a brand new car? Okay, so you're motivated. If you're going to have a breath-holding contest, probably before you start holding your breath, you're going to hyperventilate. You'll do something like this. <gasps> now, in fact, hyperventilating will actually take away your desire to breathe and allow you to hold your breath longer. But let's understand what's happened. When you start hyperventilating, you blow off carbon dioxide, and again, for every carbon dioxide you exhale, that's one less carbonic acid in your body. So by hyperventilating, you are actually lowering the acidity. You are actually creating a state of alkalosis. We might call it respiratory alkalosis. But did you actually significantly increase the amount of oxygen in your bloodstream? Remember that when a normal person breathes normal air at a normal rate, their red blood cells are 98% saturated with oxygen. They can, those red blood cells cannot carry much more oxygen than they already are. So if somebody is hyperventilating, or if somebody were breathing a richer mixture of, of oxygen than normal air, normal air is about 21% oxygen, if one were breathing 30%, 40% oxygen, does that significantly increase the amount of oxygen in your bloodstream? And the answer is no. So the person basically has decreased their desire to breathe. Why? Because by blowing off CO2 and reducing carbonic acid, they've, made this, they've created a state of alkalosis, and thus the respiratory reflex center causes a slowing down of breathing. A, uh, it, it takes away the desire to breathe, and therefore, the person is able to hold their breath longer because of this alkalotic state, but they actually never increase the amount of oxygen in their bloodstream. So potentially, this could be dangerous. The person's desire to breathe has been reduced, and yet there was no significant increase in oxygen added to the bloodstream by hyperventilating. Right below, uh, we've written sudden infant death syndrome, or SIDS, or sleep apnea. Now, these conditions are actually neurological disorders. Sudden infant death syndrome is when an infant stops breathing when they go to sleep. Sleep apnea, usually that's applied to adults who may stop breathing when they go to sleep. In both cases, the underlying problem is neurological. Normally, when somebody stops breathing, carbon dioxide starts to accumulate in their bloodstream, increasing the amount of carbonic acid, and the increased acidity would stimulate the respiratory reflex center to make the person breathe. But in these individuals who suffer from SIDS or sleep apnea, the problem is either that the central chemoreceptors are not detecting this increase in carbon dioxide and acidity, uh, or the respiratory reflex center is not responding to that signal sent by the central chemoreceptors. So the problem is not in the lungs, the problem is in the brain. In addition to the central chemoreceptors affecting the respiratory reflex center, there are also what are referred to as the peripheral chemoreceptors. Let's again return to our diagram on the next page. Returning back to page 322, we see that there are the peripheral chemoreceptors. These are sensory neurons that are sensitive to the hydrogen ion level, the carbon dioxide level, and the oxygen level in the bloodstream. These chemoreceptors are located in the aortic arch and the carotid arteries. In fact, they are located in the same place where the baroreceptors are located that we learned about when we talked about the regulation of blood pressure. 
Those were known as the aortic and carotid baroreceptors. These are known as the aortic and carotid chemoreceptors. They are constantly monitoring the acidity, CO2, and oxygen level in the bloodstream and sending that information to the respiratory reflex center. Now, while the respiratory reflex center will be affected by changes in carbon dioxide and oxygen levels, I want to remind you that the single most important factor that affects the respiratory reflex center is the central chemoreceptors informing the respiratory reflex center about the acidity of our cerebrospinal fluid. Returning back to the bottom of the previous page, so on the bottom of page 321, any time there is a decrease in oxygen levels in our systemic arterial blood, which is known as hypoxemia, low oxygen in the blood, or Anytime there's an increase in carbon dioxide level in the blood, that is known as hypercapnia, or anytime there's an increase in acidity uh, in the blood called acidosis or acidemia, these chemoreceptors uh, located in the uh, aortic arch and carotid artery send this information to the respiratory reflex center, and the respiratory reflex center will, in response, tend to increase the uh, rate of breathing by uh, speeding up the rate of breathing, the depth of breathing, and causing bronchodilation. So we do see that oxygen levels will affect or influence the respiratory reflex center. It's simply just not the major factor that affects the respiratory reflex center. Now, commonly, these three things tend to occur all together simultaneously. For example, we know that if you're exercising and your rate of cellular respiration is speeded up, so you are using up oxygen from your bloodstream at a faster rate and the oxygen level is dropping in your blood, you are generating more carbon dioxide, so the carbon dioxide level is rising in your bloodstream, and there's an increase in acidity both because the carbon dioxide reacts with water to form carbonic acid, as well as the possible formation of lactic acid. So all three of these commonly occur together, certainly when you're exercising, and that stimulates your respiratory reflex center to make you breathe faster and more deeply, which we all know happens when we exercise. Now, here I've indicated what the respiratory reflex center does whenever the oxygen level goes down, or the CO2 level or acidity goes up. Again, because of the beautiful symmetry of, of the human body, physiologically, anytime the oxygen level would rise or the CO2 level and acidity would decrease, the effect on the respiratory reflex center will be to slow down your breathing. And as you slow down the breathing, obviously the oxygen level tend to go down and the CO2 level and hydrogen ion level would start to rise to return back to the desired state. Returning back to our diagram on page 322, so we also see that the respiratory reflex center is affected by both signals from our higher brain areas. In other words, we uh, may emotionally or consciously uh, cause our respiratory reflex center to increase our rate of breathing. <laughs> or when we're excited or anxious or emotional. And conversely, uh, we may slow down our rate of breathing, again, using our higher brain centers. Uh, also, we see that signals are sent from baroreceptors that monitor our blood pressure to the respiratory reflex center. Also, signals are sent from sensory neurons in our chest, known as pulmonary stretch receptors, that may affect this. This is page 323, and this is a summary diagram of what we've been talking about. The respiratory reflex center is located in the medulla oblongata. The single most important information that the respiratory reflex center uses to regulate breathing is the hydrogen ion level in the cerebrospinal fluid around the brain. Carbon dioxide affects that simply because carbon dioxide reacts with water to form carbonic acid, increasing the acidity. This information is sent by the central chemoreceptors in the brain. 
Also affecting the respiratory reflex center are signals sent by chemoreceptors located in the aortic arch and carotid arteries. These chemoreceptors are sensitive to and monitor the oxygen level and carbon dioxide level and hydrogen ion level in the systemic arterial blood. There are other sensory neurons that send information from our chest wall, from our skeletal muscles, and elsewhere to the respiratory reflex center.